Okay, last week we saw, if you remember, Paul was preaching, remember he was preaching in the synagogue in Corinth, and there was a bit of an uproar. You know, um, you might be surprised, or maybe not surprised if you've read through the chapter, but well, we just have. Um, but in this chapter, there's, there's another uproar, okay? Multitudes of people chanting in support of a false god for hours, okay? So, however, unlike the, the previous chapter, in chapter 18, no one ends up getting beaten up in this particular one. So, but it's kind of the same thing we see as we go through the book of Acts. It's the same thing happening over and over again. So let's just jump into verse number verse number one. I don't want to be too long tonight. We've, I mean, we've had a lot to eat, so people might start to nod off, and we've still got more to go afterwards, so it better not take too long. Verse number one. It says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So Paul, he travels through the upper coast, he, he returns to Ephesus, and he finds certain disciples. Now, when he finds these disciples, I guess we want to think about this. Is everyone that would say they're a disciple actually saved? If someone says, I'm a disciple, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, does that mean that they're actually saved? No, it doesn't. Okay. In fact, when he asked them, he says, he asked them if they've received the Holy Ghost, which obviously every believer receives the Holy Ghost. You don't need to turn there, but in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, After that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So when someone gets saved, they receive the Holy Spirit of promise. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So it's saying if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, that means you're not actually saved. That's what the Bible's saying. Okay? Because, of course, the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God, which is actually says earlier in Romans 8, 9, and the Spirit of Christ, they're the same Spirit. Okay, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, um, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. But what do they say? They say that they haven't even heard that there, that there is um, a Holy Spirit, you know? So uh, it kind of makes you wonder how much of John's preaching they actually heard, because they're talking about John the Baptist, okay? It makes you wonder what they heard of his preaching. So keep your finger in Acts 19, but look at John. Look at John chapter number 1. Look at John chapter number 1 and verse number 32. I mean, this is the sort of preaching that, this is what John said. It says in um, John chapter number 1 and verse number 32. It says, And John bear record saying, I saw the Spirit, this is page 1064, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Okay, and so we see um, the Holy Spirit, that was something that John talked about quite a bit. You know, he talked, he said, I saw the Holy Ghost descending. He says, you know, and not only that, but God actually said unto me, look, the person who you see the Spirit descending on, that's the person who's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost, and that's Jesus Christ. Okay, so he talked about that a lot. So for these people to say, Holy Ghost, we never even heard that there is such a thing. Okay, and so the lesson we should learn from that is that, if we just turn back to Acts chapter 19, the lesson we should learn is we shouldn't just assume that someone is saved just because they come to church, you know, or because they say, I'm a Christian. We should ask them questions. You know, and in fact, in fact, that, that, that's actually the case. I mean, you know, a number of people have been saved where they've come to our church, and instead of just saying, "Oh, I've turned up at church," they must be saved. They must be a Christian. I mean, you ask them, "Hey, do you know for sure that, that you're going to go to heaven?" And if someone says, "No, I don't know," then what that tells you, chances are, is that they're actually they're not saved, because if someone's saved. The Bible says, these things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. Now, sometimes some will say they're not sure, and it may be when you, when you get questioned and you discover all it is, they've just been influenced by a false teaching. And as soon as you show them, it's like, yeah, that is exactly what I believe. Yes, you're right. I, I do know for sure. And, and In fact, we met someone out soloing that was, that was just like that just dur during the week, okay? Um, but we shouldn't assume someone's saved, and that's why we have to ask them questions. Because asking them questions, that's the only way to find out what it is that they believe, what it is that they're trusting in, okay? And of course, often the reason why people say, I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven is because they're really trusting in their works. And they know, well, my works really aren't good enough. I keep sinning, I keep doing these wrong things. And so they're thinking, what's, what, what's going on, okay? So here we see Paul, he asked some questions. Look at verse number, verse number three. And he said unto them, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. 
Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not sort of really going into this, but just notice in passing where it says, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. And what was it? Saying unto the people they should believe on him. You see, some people teach this idea that repentance is about you turning from your sins. It's about you stopping sinning. That, that's what repent means. Well, it's funny that God is the first person in the Bible to repent. In fact, he repents more than anyone else. So that's not, not, it's not what it's talking about. Repent just means change. And there's a specific change people need to make in order to be saved. If they're not saved, they need to change what they believe. They need to change who they're trusting. In. They need to put their trust in Jesus, not in themselves. Okay, But that's sort of not um, what I'm really wanting to point out here. We see... Paul, he questioned them, and then he explained some things to them. So he questioned them, and, and then he says, well, actually, no, this is the way that it is. And I mean, I'm pretty sure that the, the conversation they had would have been longer that's re- than, than it's recorded just in these couple of verses here. Okay? Um, I mean, because the thing about it is, Paul wasn't what you'd call, he wasn't a one, two, three, repeat after me soul winner. I don't know if you've ever heard that expression. Some people talk about that, saying, you know, someone that they just go out and they just say, one, two, three, repeat after me. They give a couple of verses and just, yeah, pray this prayer and you're saved. No, I mean, in order to be saved, someone needs to trust in Jesus. So we need to preach the gospel to them. So we need to, we need to give them a number of verses, but we need to establish what they believe. And we need to persuade them to believe. We need to change what they believe if we can. Now, ultimately, we can't. But what we can do is present God's word. And the Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, <coughs> and hearing by the word of God. You know, the thing is, we need to be thorough. I mean, I mean a good example of this, if you just, just look back a page in Acts chapter number 17. Acts chapter number 17 and verse number 32. Acts chapter 17, verse 32. I mean, there's a very famous account of the, remember the Philippian jailer? And we always, you know, our soul, we always use verse 31. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But then notice what it says in verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. So notice, Paul, you know, he spake the word of the Lord to this Philippian jailer and to his family as well. So it wasn't just, a, it wasn't just you know, one verse that he said. It wasn't just one thing. You know, he actually spake God's word to them. So Paul was thorough and we need to be thorough when it comes to giving the gospel. Okay, don't be half-hearted about it. Back in um, Acts chapter 19, look at verse number 5. Acts chapter number 19 and verse number 5. <coughs> and when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they get baptized now. Why would it be that they would get baptized? Because they now believe. So Paul has explained to them the actual gospel. They've actually got saved. So then they get baptized. Okay? Um, because the thing about it is, is there is one condition when it comes to baptism. And what is it? You've got to be saved. You have to believe the gospel. Um, have a look back in Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter number 8 and verse number... Acts chapter 8, verse 35. You might say, well, this is familiar. We often go to these verses. But it's important. We need to know these verses. We need to have them so that if anyone asks, hey, why is it that if someone got baptized before they got saved, why is it that that's not legitimate? Why is it that they need to be baptized again, which is what we're going to look at in this chapter? Well, because the, the Bible says in Acts chapter 8, verse 35, it says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So Philip preaches the, the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He says, Is there any reason I can't get baptized? And Philip said, well, providing you're reading King James, and Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So notice there's a number of things to point out here. One thing is obviously verse 37. It's in the King King James Bible, and it's not in a whole pile of other Bibles. Lots of other Bibles say, any reason I can't get baptized? He baptizes him. Doesn't answer his question. You know, and obviously that leads to infant baptism and all sorts of stuff. I mean, the, the lady I gave the gospel to today, that was she was baptized as a baby because she was brought up as an Anglican. Okay? Um, and so, and, and how does that come about? Because she asked me, why is it, why do they do that? Well, the Anglican, they get it basically from the Catholic Church. And where did the Catholic Church get it from? Well, because they believe that baptism is part of salvation. Yeah. And so, and she said, but, but surely, I mean, like a little baby hasn't got any sins. Well, no, they believe that a baby has inherits the, 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 the sin of Adam, okay? So, um, it's original sin or something like that. And so that's why they're going to baptize them, because if they don't baptize them, well, then the baby would go to hell. 
Okay? That's, that's honestly, that is where it comes from. That is what it actually comes from, okay? Um, but no, here we see there's a condition in the Bible. It says you've got to believe, then you can get baptized. You have to believe, then you get baptized. And obviously you can also see that baptism is actually immersion. It's not like some sort of sprinkling, which a lot of churches do as well. Because it says they went down into the water. Same thing when Jesus got baptized. They go down into the water, they come up out of the water. Because baptism pictures Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. Okay? And so that's what it is. Burial means you go under, and then you come back out. Okay, back in Acts chapter number 19, Acts chapter number 19, so when they heard this, what happened? They get baptized, even though they'd already been baptized, okay? So that's the thing. If you got baptized before you got saved, then the right thing is to get baptized again, because other, the other baptism, it was just getting wet, okay? I've been wet lots of times. I'm sure you've all been wet lots of times, but that's not baptism. Baptism is something that you do after you get saved, where you profess your faith in Jesus, you go under the water and come out, simple as that. Okay, verse number, <clears throat> verse number 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about 12. So here we see God confirms what Paul did. Okay, Paul has preached this thing to them. They've got baptized again, and what actually happens? It says, you know, the, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So God basically shows a sign. And we can see, was Paul doing the right thing to baptize them again? Absolutely. God confirmed it by giving this miraculous sign. Now, you might say, well, hang on, why doesn't that happen today? Why is it when people get baptized today? I mean, you know, a lot of you guys, when we baptized you, did you come out of the water, up out of the water and start speaking in tongues and prophesying? Did that happen? I don't think so. I, don't, I didn't notice it. Okay? Well, the reason is because we now have the completed word of God. Do, do we, we, didn't, we don't need a sign. You see, the Bible talks about um, how God um, confirms his word with signs. That happened at various times. You know, you can go back, look in the Old Testament, it talks about that, about, um, I think it was Elijah. You know, the woman said, now I know, you know, that, that, you know, basically the word of God is true that you're saying because he did this amazing sign. I think he might have raised your son from the dead or something like that. Okay, so God confirmed the words with sign following. But we've got God's completed word. And so we can turn, as we just did, to Acts chapter number 8 and see that you get saved and you, you've, and you get baptized, okay? That the condition for being baptized is you've got to be saved. Paul couldn't turn to Acts chapter 8 because it wasn't written at that stage, you know? He didn't have that, okay? The Bible wasn't written at that point. So God was doing supernatural things. And obviously, he was the apostle Paul, etc., etc. Okay, let's continue on. Verse number, verse number 8. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So Paul continues preaching both to Jews and also to Gentiles. And what does he do? He attempts to persuade them. That's what we should do too. You know, it says in um, Corinthians, I think it says that, you know, wherefore knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You know, Paul was constantly trying to persuade people. We should try to persuade people to believe, okay? But also notice it requires boldness. I mean, he was there. He was speaking boldly. It requires boldness. Look if you were at um, uh, Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6, page 1183. Ephesians chapter number 6, and verse number... Oh, look, start at verse number 18. It says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. This is Paul speaking. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So notice how often Paul's saying, Please pray for me that I would open my mouth and speak boldly. Okay? And here we see he's doing that, okay? He, he's speaking boldly. And so Paul, if Paul needed people to pray for him that he would be bold, don't we need to pray for each other that we would be bold and open our mouths? Absolutely we do, okay? So it's important there. It requires boldness. Um, just also notice here in this verse it talks about, this is um, the only mention of school in the Bible. It says disputed daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Um, the only mention of school in the Bible, it doesn't actually sound like a, a positive mention. Okay, but they're disputing there. Now, you might sort of ask, well, are schools a good thing? 
you know, school, I mean, art school is just a common thing. That's what everyone has schools. And um, I guess the thing about it is, when it comes to schools, schools aren't necessarily a good thing. I mean, none of my children, have, well, the ones that are here at home, have been to school. None of them have been to school at all. And, you know, my wife has homeschooled them all. Yeah. Um, and I believe that, that that's, a, that's a biblical concept. Okay, to homeschool, to teach your children. I mean, the Bible actually talks about how we should teach our children. And it uses the word thou. Okay, you don't see an example in the Bible of where, where God's people would take their kids and send them off, you know, let's send them off to the Philistines to educate them and then come back. Do we see that happening in the Bible? We don't see it happening. And the thing about it is, if you think about it, I mean, what would happen if you sent your kids, if, the, if God's people had sent their, their kids off to the Philistines to educate? What would have come back? Little Philistines. Well, guess what? If you send your kids off to the public school or even to some religious school, I mean, they're going to come back having been taught whatever it is. I mean, if it's a public school, they'll be taught evolution, won't they? They'll be taught you come from monkeys, you know, all that sort of stuff. That's what they'll be taught, okay? Um, and the thing is, I mean, often schools were started with good intentions, you know? I mean, there's the schools, the, the sort of modern stuff in the Western world, it's been around a few hundred years, but schools have been around for a long time. You can go look in all sorts of societies and cultures, Greek times, Roman times, all that sort of stuff. I mean, one of the reasons is because you want people to be able to, to read and write, and it makes them useful, you know, citizens, if you like, and so training them and teaching them. But the thing about that is, why it's somewhat, sometimes come about, and many of the schools that have been started today, started, they were started by churches, Churches would start, it was like a Sunday school that over time eventually developed into an actual school. Because you had these children that, that were uneducated. And so you did, but they wanted them to be able to read the Bible. And so they would teach them. Okay? And so you can kind of think, that's, you know, you can understand the thinking behind it. But the problem with that, although that would maybe had good intentions, is that everyone's kids would start going to that. In other words, I mean, are there people who maybe might have parents that would have str- would struggle to teach them? Yeah, that could be the case. I mean, if, 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 the, if the mother and father can't read and write, they're going to have a hard job teaching their kids to read and write, aren't they? But certainly, I mean, in today's world, that should be very much a, a, a minority case, shouldn't it? But if you're perfectly capable of teaching your own children, and you don't do that, and you ship them off somewhere else, then that means you're not, you're not doing what God's wanting you to do, and, and this kind of, it's kind of going against what the, what the Bible talks about. Like it says, um, for example, in First Timothy chapter 5, I will therefore that the younger woman marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. God says that a woman's place is in the home, teaching the children. And the man's place is to go out and work and to provide for his family. Okay? And the Bible says, if any provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Okay, so... These roles, and of course, in the society we live in today, that's no longer the case. Is that is that what people normally do now in the Western world, or is it just mum and dad both work? Yeah, mum and dad both work. So what does the kid? What do the kids do? Well, they have to go off to school, and they get taught whatever the government tells them they should teach. Okay, um, so I'm not really preaching on that, but just I just it's the only place the word school shows up in the Bible, so it's right there. Um, and, and in many cases, schools they are a, a force for bad. They teach bad things at schools. Um, verse, number, verse number 10. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So they, they continued preaching and teaching for two years, and everyone heard the word of the Lord. Okay, so that, they were obviously real busy. They were going everywhere. Everyone heard the word of the Lord. Um, verse number 11. And God wrought, which means worked, special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So Paul did special miracles. In other words, miracles that other people weren't doing. Okay, pretty much. Now, there are people today who claim to do that same stuff. But, you know, they're charlatans and frauds on the TV. You know, send me this money and I'll send you some prayer cloth that's going to heal you, or whatever. I don't see Paul asking for any money, okay? And it, it, it's, it's a shame, that stuff that's going on there. But, um, yeah, they, they were special miracles that Paul did, you know? It wasn't just that every pot, everybody was doing these miracles. Look at verse number 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. 
And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. So what we see here is we see other people, people who weren't saved. And what were they trying to do? They were trying to copy what Paul was doing. Paul was doing these amazing miracles, driving out devils and doing all these things. And so these people are trying to copy what Paul did. That's why they say, you know, we enjoy you by Jesus, you know, whom Paul preacheth, you know, to, to come out. Okay, and so we need to understand from this. Because um, we see what happened to them. Like, the evil spirit answered them. He said, look, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? So spiritual forces, they're real. They're not, and they're not something to play around with. You know, I mean, some people think that they can play around, they can mess around with, with these things, uh, what we call it, the occult. You know, you know, Ouija boards and seances and all these different things. They can, they're going to get into, and it's like, no. The Bible says we should have nothing to do with it. It's dangerous. And what happened to these people? They fled naked and wounded. They got beaten up. Okay? Um, it's, it's a dangerous thing. Uh, verse, number, verse number 17. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So Jesus' name was magnified. That means it was made larger. You know, you get a magnifying glass. What do you do when you look at something magnifying glass? It makes it bigger. Well, if Jesus' name is magnified, it's made bigger. It's lifted up, you know. Um, verse, number, <coughs> verse number 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So here we see many of the believers, what do they do? They turned away from some of their sinful practices. Even though it cost them a lot. I mean, 50,000 pieces of silver, that's worth a lot. But what did they do? They got rid of it. They took the, these magic books and stuff and they, they burnt them. They got rid of them. But notice also it says that many. Okay, many of the believers. So did all of them do it? No, not all of them did. Many of them did. But obviously some of them didn't. Otherwise it would said all of the believers did it. Okay, but we should have the same attitude that they have. You know, these bad things that they had in their life, get rid of them. Okay? Now, hopefully you haven't got magic books lying around. Hopefully you haven't got, you know, things for casting spells and, and that sort of stuff, occult stuff. But maybe you've got some other things. You know, maybe you've got maybe you've got music. Maybe you've got music from when you're unsaved. Maybe you've got rock music. You know, maybe you've got I mean all sorts of bad music, because I mean there's a lot of bad stuff in music. Okay? And I mean many people have done that. In fact, I mean I've I've got a whole well, I, I used to have a whole music collection. I had all sorts of CDs and DVDs. And after I got saved, you know, and I didn't do it straight away, I got rid of them all. Yeah. Threw them out. Threw them in the rubbish. Yeah. Why? Because it's like, you know, now, did they cost money? Yeah, I mean, CDs, what were they? I mean, nowadays when people just sort of download it all, but back in those days, you had to pay like 30 bucks or something for a CD. You know, you throw them out. You get rid of them. Yeah. Okay? And that's exactly what we see, you know? And, and notice it says, um, uh, look, at the, look at the next verse, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. You see, when we turn to God, even though there may be a cost, it increases our effectiveness. They became more effective because of what they do. But just also notice that um, it, it did say many. It said many of them which used, many that believed, confessed and showed their deeds, many which of them which also used curious arts brought their books together. You see, because some people have this idea to say, look, if you got saved, then you would. So translate that into now to, nowadays. So, okay, let's say you've got these, you know, um, Maybe you've got some heavy metal CDs or something like that, some you know, some wicked bad stuff. So they'd say, well, okay, well, if you don't, if you didn't throw them out, that proves you're not really saved. Because if you're really saved, you would have done that. And so they they like to use this term, the evidence of salvation, the evidence of salvation to say. And, and often these people they'll, they'll put these stipulations: you've got to do these things before you get baptized. That's why they'll, they'll you have a baptism class and you go through a class that will last for weeks. It's just about tidying up your life, you know? I mean, you know. I mean, if you're a guy, maybe you need to get a haircut, you know? Um, maybe if you're a lady, you need to start growing your hair long, you know? I mean, these, some of these, you know, tidying things up in your life, stopping, you know, giving up smoking, giving up drinking, whatever it may be. And then they sort of say, well, look, and if you then do that, then we baptise you because now we're, we're sure you're saved. As though that's kind of evidence. But it, it doesn't really make any sense to say that's evidence because, I mean, pick something like drinking, Okay. If, if giving up drinking was evidence of being saved, then what would happen to someone who went along to Alcoholics Anonymous and gave up drinking? Does that mean they're saved? 
No. Well, then, then how is that evidence? It's not. You know, it's a, it's, it's a crazy, crazy sort of idea. Anyway, let's move on. Verse number 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. So Paul, he decides he's going to visit Jerusalem and Rome, but before he leaves, we're going to find out um, trouble is going to come. Look at verse number, uh, verse number 23. Um, and the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. So no small stir means there's a big stir. Yeah. Look at verse number 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. So notice, there's this guy here, and what does he do? He's making these silver shrines for Diana, and Diana's this, this false god. So he's making these, these silver shrines. You know, this is his income. He's making money from it. Look at this, verse 25. Whom he called together with the workmen of like occupations, other people that are making money from that sort of thing, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft... We have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone in Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this, our craft is in danger, we said at naught. He said, we're going to lose out on our money because if people stop worshiping Diana, they're not going to be buying these things anymore from us. But also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia, <coughs> excuse me, and the world worshippeth. Now one of the reasons people can be involved with false religion is because they profit from it. And this guy's making a profit from it. Now we can see this today in, in fake Christianity. You know, the TV preachers. You know, there are many people who are making money from it. I'm a fact, I remember reading about um, the Anglican, some Anglican bishops and there was a, like quite a high percentage of them who actually, when they were asked, well, you know, what do you believe about God? They were actually atheists. And yet they're, they're, they're actually a leader in the, in the Anglican church. It's like, well, how come? Because, well, guess what? It's pretty good whack. You know, they get paid plenty. It's a pretty cushy job. You know, just got to crank out some sort of small sermon each week. But you just waffle about, you know, be good, love one another, have a cup of tea, go home. You know, I mean, there's a lot harder jobs. A lot harder than working in the mines or something like that, wouldn't it? Okay. Well, that, there's people that do that. And of course, it's also true in other religions as well. There's a lot of people in, in other religions that are making money from it. But of course, the thing about it is, I mean, I mean you can actually look at, there are, I mean, some of the wealthiest groups in the world are, I mean, Catholic Church. How wealthy is that? Unbelievably wealthy. You know, the Mormons, how wealthy are they? You know, I mean, just look at these various false religions and you see the buildings they've got. Millions and millions upon billions of dollars they've got. Okay? Um... But the thing about it is, is when you threaten someone's income, it can cause them to become pretty angry. You know, um, I mean, I was actually wondering, I was, I was reading an article earlier on about a guy called um, Dr. Lance O'Sullivan. You might have heard of Dr. Lance O'Sullivan, you might have heard of him. I think he practices up in the, up in the far north somewhere. You should, you should have heard of him, maybe, if, I don't know, if you, maybe, well, then if you don't follow the news, then that would be fair enough. But um, he was actually New Zealander of the Year, 2014, he was the New Zealander of the Year, and um, I was reading this article from uh, May 24th, 2017. And, um, yeah, basically he got this award as the New Zealand of the Year for his work bringing health programs to disadvantaged rural areas. Rural areas. But um, this was talking about how <coughs> basically he leapt onto a stage to protest the screening of a controversial anti-vaccination movie called Vaxxed. And, um, and so the, 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 this guy was, was questioning him about it. And he said, he said, why did you get on the stage? And he said, well, I was always intending to go to protest the presence of that movement, that campaign of peddling misinformation and falsehoods in our country and in my community. So he's really anti the anti-vaxxers. Okay, so he's very much pro-vaccination. It's really, you know, and he's a doctor and it's important. It's you must get vac vaccinated. And he's very much a, uh, you know, um, what would you call it, a crusader for that. Um, and uh, the person said, well, you know, because he was actually invited to go along. And they said, well, what was, your, you know, what was their agenda inviting you? He says, I don't know, to be honest. I, I don't think actually, and we, we'll see as we look through this, he didn't really talk to them very much. He didn't talk to them at all. Okay? Um, so he says, um, I guess what they were hoping was that, was that they could convince me of something I had absolutely no reason to believe 
there's even an ounce of credibility to. So he's very clear. He says, look, this whole anti-vaccination thing, he says there is no credibility. There's not an ounce of credibility to it. This is what he's saying. He says, this is essentially like saying, so this is the, he's saying this is what the anti-vaxxers are like. He's saying it's essentially like saying to me that seatbelts are unsafe and nobody should wear them. Now, I mean, I mean, let's be honest. Come on. How many people have been injured from putting on a seatbelt? Is there, really? Is there anyone? No. Haven't, haven't seatbelts saved plenty of lives? Absolutely. Is there anyone, any, anywhere, ever, who has ever been injured by a vaccine? Is there? I mean, there has to be. I mean, is he pretending that there's not? I mean, that's what he's sounding like. Okay? He's pretending that no one's ever. Okay? Now, people have different views about how dangerous they are and, and so forth. And I'm not preaching on that, that tonight. I've, I've done that previously. Um, but the thing about it is, he's not being honest with what he's saying here. I mean, there are people with, you know, permanently disabled, people with, with dead children. I mean, there's many examples. I mean, there was, in fact, wasn't there something recently? Was it in, was it in Samoa? It was the Samoa. There was some, a bunch of kids died, didn't they? Yeah, yeah a bunch of kids died from vaccinations. But it's, not, it's just like putting on a seatbelt. It's perfectly safe. No, no. Um, what does he say here? He says, um, two years ago, I talked about how we should be tagging our benefits to immunisation. He's saying, what we should do is, if you don't, basically, if you don't, um, Immunise your kids, then you shouldn't. If you're if you're on the if you're a beneficiary, yeah. If you're on the benefit, you have a child who isn't immunised. There should be a financial consequence. In other words, we'll take some of your money. We won't let you get as much of a benefit. Okay. And he says here, people just don't immunise because, to be quite frank, they listen to rubbish like this. He says, look, this is the reason why is because of listening to this like this anti-vaccination you know movie. That's why they don't get vaccinated. And then he goes on and he says, look, he says um. These people, he says, these aren't people that hold the ravaged bodies of young children in our emergency departments. Well, no, I mean, maybe some of them are the people that hold the, the ravaged young bodies of people who, who died from vaccinations, yeah. just like we've seen happen recently. And it's not an isolated incident. It's happened many times before, okay? And that's not to count the people that have been damaged, that they still live on, right. permanently damaged yep. for the rest of their lives, you know? And often you find many, I mean... I'm thankful of, I'm not in that situation myself, but many people who are involved in this, they've got a, a child who's been damaged by vac you know, vaccines. I mean, was the one I was reading about, was it like twins? They took them in, got their vaccine, and they both, within a matter of minutes. And that was it, never the same again. Okay? And he says here, um, he says, quite frankly, he says, they are promoting lies that will harm communities like mine. Um, so he says, um, Oh, the guy asked him, he said, what would be your message to those who dispute this? So people who don't agree with you, what would you say to them? He says, well, look, I don't even know if I have enough time to engage in conversation about it. So he's basically saying, I'm not going to talk to you about it. So if you don't agree with me, if you don't agree with vaccines, I'm not going to talk to you about it. And then he says, they're actually quite a vile group of people. Okay, so he says, look, if you don't agree with vaccinations, you're actually a vile person. That's what he's saying. You're part of a vile group of people. And then he says, one of them has started attacking my family. Um, one of the offensive things they've said is that I'm doing this for money. That I get paid to immunise children, and I'm doing this because I'm the whore of pharmaceutical companies. He says, that's so offensive, it's not funny. So he's really offended by people suggesting that he's doing it for money, that there's some sort of financial reward in it. Now, just to be clear, is there, if you're a doctor... Is there a financial reward for having more people getting vaccinated? Mm -hmm. Yes, there is. There is. They get rewarded for it. And not only that, I mean, there's, there's a whole pile of stuff they get. They get taken on trips. They have, there's all sorts of perks. I mean, it's quite crazy. The things that, that doctors are allowed to be paid, the things they're allowed to get, which if they were a, like a policeman or if they were like a judge, it would be called bribery. You know, it's corrupt, but somehow it's okay for doctors or for medical researchers. You can pay them. You can give them all this sorts it's fine, and their and their research findings and their, and and what they're promoting, it's it won't be influenced at all. But then and then he goes on. And this is the same person who just a couple of sentences before said they're actually quite a vile group of people. He then says, "I've at no time ever attacked these individuals." Sorry, and and this is understand. This is a positive article. This is not someone written against him. This is someone that's in his favour. So he says they're vile. 
but I've never, I've never attacked these individuals. Um, and then he says, I don't think I'd give them the time of day because I don't think they're worthy of it. So they're vile, they're not worth the time of day. I mean, he's got absolutely no respect for any of these people. And then someone goes, um, uh, he says, what would you say to those who are on the fence? He says, look, I haven't watched this movie, and for good reason. So the movie he was protesting about, he hasn't actually seen it. So he doesn't talk to anybody, and he doesn't watch their stuff. You know, it's just, talk about the definition of ignorance. But he says, look, I will not let the counter click over one by one more on YouTube by me watching it. It's like, I mean, come on, get real. So just so you keep it one lower, you want to be ignorant, okay? Um, he says, these people will call us, cause us immeasurable harm and the greatest way to protest is to ignore them. And so, I mean, and you'll understand because later on we're going to see some of this thing where people, they're just ignoring things. And, um, but the thing about it is, is people can get angry when you threaten their income. They can get angry. But also this, he's a prime example. And I mean, the guy's New Zealander of the Year, 2014, he was New Zealand of the Year. But it's just like he's, it's like he's blind. He's got, it's like, don't tell me anything. Don't show me anything. But I, I just know what's right. I know what's right. Let's, let's move on. But um, I, I just came across that. It just, yeah. it bothers me, you see. Yes. Look at verse number, verse number 28. Verse number 28. It says, um, so remember what's happening here. So these guys, they're like, our income's going to be affected. People aren't going to be buying the stuff anymore. <coughs> Look, it says in verse number 28, And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in the travel, they rushed with one accord into the theatre. So these people got really mad. They got really, really mad. And it's a, it's a bad sign when people get angry about something, and they get so angry that they refuse to listen. They refuse to listen. And that's exactly, that's exactly what it is. These people, they got mad and they cried out saying, great is dying of the fish. They were really angry. They were really, I'm sure this guy, um, Lance O'Sullivan, he's really angry. And he doesn't want to listen. If, if you don't listen, I mean, are you, are you going to learn anything? It's, it's a crazy idea. The Bible says, let a man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Look at verse number 30. Verse number 30. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him, that he would not adventure himself into the theatre. So Paul's friends, they're trying to protect him. They say, look, keep back, because, I mean, this is a dangerous mob that's, that's you know, out there. Um, verse number 32. <coughs> some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. So a lot of people have been stirred up, but a lot of them don't really know what's going on. And I mean, the world we live in today is a lot, is a, it's a lot like that. I mean, many people get their opinions from the media, yeah. you know, whether it's the TV or whether it's online or even talk back radio, whatever. They get people giving their opinions and it's just like, they just take, oh yeah, that's, that's my opinion. Whatever, whatever they say, that becomes my opinion. They let some expert form their opinion for them instead of actually thinking for themselves. I mean, a lot of people will have been influenced by this Dr. Lance O'Sullivan. Yeah. A lot of people will be influenced by, yeah, vaccines must be really bad. These people that are anti-vaccine, they're really bad people. They're vile people. Because the doctor says so. Yeah. The New Zealander of the year says so. It must be true. Okay? Now, but, but guess what? He doesn't listen. And so other people, they, they follow him, and they don't listen either. They, they, let some, they let him form their opinion instead of thinking for themselves. And even asking a simple question. And I'm not trying to preach on vaccines tonight, but I mean, in all honesty, go back and look at these de diseases. Yeah. And you look at the death rates of these diseases. And you, and you can see the graphs, and you can look in New Zealand, you look in Australia, you can look all around the world, and you can see that th there were thousands of people dying from many of these diseases. And then you see it drop down, wow, wow, like that. But then you can also go back and see, well, hang on, when was the vaccine introduced? And I've done, I did this, it was years ago that I did it, but I went back and looked at the official New Zealand statistics, and the same in Australia and in other countries overseas, and when were the vaccines introduced compared to the death rate and what happened? The death rate dropped way before the vaccines were introduced. Now guess what? That means that the vaccines can't be the thing that caused the drop in the death rate. That's impossible. Okay? So Lance O'Sullivan, who doesn't want to listen to anyone, he just assumes if you don't get into the, the vaccinations, then you're a vile person. If he actually listened, you know, he doesn't realise that someone could... Now, am I saying that there aren't some nasty people that could be anti-vaccine? Oh, sure, there could be. 
I mean, you, guess what? There's some crazy people in the world. You can, you know, you can find some crazy people that believe all sorts of things. But to say, okay, well, this person is a crazy, nasty person who says bad things about me and my family. Therefore, anyone who believes whatever that particular thing is, is a crazy, bad person and a vile person. No, that's, that, that's silly. That's like, that's like attacking someone because of their skin colour. You know, I, I was beaten up by someone who's got this skin colour, therefore all those people are bad people. It's crazy. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, um, let's look at verse number, verse number 33. Verse 33. Um, <coughs> and they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defence unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So one of them gets put before the people to defend himself, but there's not really a point because the people, they're not listening. They're not, they're not paying any attention. I mean, what it says, it says, for two hours they cried out, great is Diana. Imagine, uh, you know, you've got a horde of people and they're just shouting, great is Diana of the Ephesians, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Now, are they listening at the same time? No, they're not. Okay, they're not listening. And that's the thing. That's one of the reasons why when, I, when I'm at soul winning, I always ask people, whether they're open-minded. Now, you know, when you're first giving, you want an office to give someone the gospel, and sometimes people, it doesn't sound like they're particularly interested. Now, I will still, because I'm trying to persuade people, yeah. I will try and give them the gospel, but one of the things I do ask them is whether they're open-minded. And, you know, because if someone says, look, hey, I'm not open-minded, I'm not open-minded at all, it's like, well, you know, it's a, it's a really a waste of time, because yeah. they're just not going to listen. But the most frequent people who say that they aren't open-minded, because some people will look at it and say, no, I'm not open-minded. The most frequent people who say that are actually atheists, which is pretty bizarre when you think about it, because atheists, they're supposed to be, well, we're just evidence-based, we're as open-minded as they can come. Yeah. And yet the majority of people who say, no, I'm not open-minded, are actually atheists, which is it's bizarre, really, when you think about it. Look at verse number 35. Verse number 35. <coughs> And when the town clerk had appeased the people, so he calms them down, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. So the town clerk, he appeases the people, he tells them there's nothing to be concerned about. I mean, that's good advice, even though it's spoken by an official who's most likely an unbeliever. I mean, what he's saying is quite sensible. He says, look, be quiet, calm down, don't do, don't act rashly. Is that wise advice? Sounds like wise advice to me, you know. And, and the thing is, just because we don't agree with the position someone holds doesn't mean we should disagree with everything they say. You know, I mean, if I read something from Lance O'Sullivan that I agreed with, I would say, I agree with that. I wouldn't just disagree with it because I disagree with them in some other areas. You know what I'm saying? Yet some people have this idea that because they don't agree with someone, it's just like we just write off everything they say, which is a foolish idea. I mean, the Bible makes it really clear that we shouldn't um, be rash, yeah. that we shouldn't be, be hasty. I mean, look at, um, look at Proverbs chapter number 19. Proverbs chapter, keep your finger in Acts 19. We'll finish up pretty soon. Uh, Proverbs chapter number 19 and verse number 2. Proverbs chapter number 19 <clears throat> and verse number 2 it says also that the soul be without knowledge it is not good so it's not good Lance O'Sullivan it's not good that the soul be without knowledge you could do with getting some knowledge and he that hasteth with his feet sinneth notice that he that hasteth with his feet sinneth guess what being hasty according to the Bible you're going to sin Okay, look at Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Just after uh, Proverbs, you've got Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse number 9. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Notice that, anger resteth in the bosom of fools, but it says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. See, it's not that you should never be angry. The Bible says, Be angry and sin not. Jesus was angry sometimes. But Jesus is God, and what does the Bible say about God? He's slow to anger. He says, look here, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. Look at um, Proverbs chapter number 29. Proverbs chapter number 29 and verse number 20. Proverbs chapter number 29 
and verse number 20, Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 20, says, Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words? There is more hope of a fool than of him. So is it good to be hasty with what you say? No, it's not. It's not, to be, it's not good to be hasty. Think about what you say. Think before you speak. Think before you speak. Um, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 29. Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 29. Proverbs 14, 29. <clears throat> says, he that is slow to wrath, that's slow to get angry. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. But he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Notice that. Being slow to get angry, that's a good thing. But being having a hasty spirit, that's foolish. That's folly. You know, look at James chapter number 1. James chapter number 1. James chapter number 1. And verse number 19. James chapter number 1. And verse number, <coughs> excuse me, 19. James 1, 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. Why? Verse 20. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. I have to remember this when I get angry. This verse has to come back to me to say, look, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You get angry, is that going to lead to God's righteousness? No, most likely it's not. Okay? So why? It says, let every man be swift to hear, quick to hear, be quick to listen. We've got two ears and one mouth. Be swift to hear and slow to speak. And slow to get angry. Let's get back to Acts 19. We'll finish up. Acts chapter 19, verse number <coughs> verse number 37. He says, For you have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. So he points out, because he's, he's, he's trying to calm them down, he's pointing out, look, these guys aren't thieves. You know, they're, they're not robbers. Um, he says, they're, they're not blasphemers of your goddess. I, I'd say probably the anti-blasphemy position, that's probably not accurate. I'd say, I'd say, you'd probably say they were actually blaspheming the goddess, I would say. Um, I, mean, they were, I mean, they were going around teaching that these aren't gods. These aren't gods. So in their book, that would have been blasphemy um, of their goddess. But anyway, um, but, you know, and understand, not that we should be deliberately going around causing animosity. We shouldn't. Okay? It's not a case of, are there false religions out there? Yeah, but, we should, but should we be going around deliberately trying to make a big song and dance and and, and, and call people out and draw attention to ourselves, or should we be just doing be doing what we're told to do, which is preach the gospel, you know? And so, you know, when you go and you meet someone who's from a false religion, you're not going to, you know, when I go to give the gospel to a, to a Catholic, I don't sort of knock on their door and start railing on the Pope. Why? Because they're not going to listen to anything I say. I want to give them the gospel first. Yeah. Now, I'll give them the gospel first. Now, after I've given the gospel, um, I'll then point out some things about the Pope, yeah. you know? When I, I, I'll give the gospel to a Muslim, and then afterwards I'll point out some things about Muhammad. You know, that he was a pedophile. Yes, Muhammad was a pedophile. He married a girl when she was seven years old, and he consummated the marriage when she was nine. And that's what it says in, you know, in the Muslim sources. It says that. And you ask Muslims, they agree. Okay, now, marrying a seven year old and consummating the marriage when she's nine. I mean, look, there's my daughter there, she's eight. Okay, she's eight years old. And guess what would someone who married someone that age be? They're, they're a child molester. They're a pedophile. Okay, and, it's, and people say, oh, well, it was okay back then. That's just what people did back then. It's never been okay. I mean, let me give you a newsflash. There are people today who think it's fine. There are countries in the world where they have child brides. A lot of it, like Muslim majority country, places like Pakistan, a lot of it goes on in places like that. Okay. And there's, I mean, off topic, but there's another, there's a whole movement today as well from the whole, I, I never know how many letters go in there, the LGBTQ, whatever, the, the homos. That's right. And what are they promoting? It's all that, it doesn't matter who you love, but you know, have you seen the new things that are coming out that they're pushing? Doesn't matter who you love, it doesn't matter what, does, love knows no gender, but you know what they also say now? Love knows no age. What do they want to do? They're promoting molesting children. They're pro promoting pedophilia. And that's, that's just a fact. It's out there. Okay? And even, this is even in academic circles. There are people out there at universities that promote this sort of thing. It's, it's crazy. You wouldn't believe it. But hey, look, Jesus said before he comes back, he says, as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be. And that's the days we're living in. Okay, let's continue on. We better finish up. Um, verse, number, <coughs> verse number 38. 
verse number 38. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open and there are deputies. Let them implead one another. But if you inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. So he tells them that they, they should be doing things according to due legal process. You know, there's a right way to do things. God has ordained that there be governments, and they're there for a reason. I mean, specifically says in um, Romans chapter number 13, he specifically says in Romans 13, he says, Romans 13 verse number 3, he says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Now understand, is that really true of all rulers? Okay, so Hitler is, was not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Was that right? No. Okay, but this is saying, this is what rulers are supposed to be like. Okay, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will they then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and they shall have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God. He's the servant of God to thee for good. So rulers, they're actually, they're a minister of God. They're serving God, or they should be serving God. But if they do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, the servant of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So one of the purposes of government is to execute wrath upon people who do evil, who do wrong. And he's got a sword. Okay? So which is why these people that are doing evil, people that are molesting children, people that are raping and murdering, they should be put to death by the government. Okay? That's what they're for. He says, wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake, for for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, they're God's servants, attending, attending continually upon this very thing. That's what they are supposed to be doing. That's what, the, that's what governments are supposed to be doing. Back in Acts chapter number uh, 19, Acts 19 verse number 40. Acts 19 verse 40. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. So basically he explains, look, there's no reasonable excuse for the uproar that's taken place. I mean, because can you imagine what happened before? Yeah, I don't know how many people, could have been thousands of people, chanting, great is Diana of the Ephesians, for two hours, it says. Okay? Um, I, mean, I mean, maybe you can imagine. I mean, can you imagine someone doing that today? Chanting the name of some false god for hours. I can imagine some, you know, in some Muslim countries that going on. Yeah. You've seen them all going around the, yeah. the Kabbalah or whatever, the, the rock or whatever. Okay, and what is he? And then he dismisses them. So, yeah, just in conclusion, we saw at the start of the chapter, remember we saw the importance of disciples actually being saved. You need to check, just because someone says I'm a Christian, doesn't mean they're saved. You know, not everyone who says they're a Christian really is. And we need to ask questions to see what people believe and to be prepared to teach the truth to them, to preach the truth to them, even though it might be offensive to some. Now, I realise when someone comes to church, you know, they're not necessarily expecting someone to go up to them and, and ask them if they're saved. But after the service, that is what I do. Yeah. Okay, why? Because I might never see them again. I mean, it's a great opportunity. They've obviously got some interest in God. They've got some interest in the Bible. Presume that's why they showed up to a church. So you preach the gospel to them. Give them the opportunity to be saved. Okay, um, even though some people get offended. Some people will be horrified. But would, some, would I be horrified if someone asked me if I was saved? If someone asked me, what are you trusting in to get to heaven? No, I tell them what I believe. I tell them what the Bible says. Yeah. You know, it's not going to offend me. You know, I'm happy. Um, anyway, what else we saw? Well, we also saw, remember, messing with the occult. That was dangerous. Remember what happened to the sons of Seir? They were chased out and beaten and, and, and so forth. <coughs> um, yeah, it's dangerous to mess with the occult. And also God's blessing comes when people sacrifice ungodly things for him, when you get those bad things out of your life. Even if it costs you. Even if it costs you. You know? I mean... Don't you think it probably cost us when, when my wife stopped working and came home and never worked again? Don't you think it probably cost us? Yeah, she was a school teacher. Okay, there was money to be had. In fact, you know, I'm just trying to think if we, um, I don't think I was even working at the time, I think I was even a student. So we survived on no money for a while. Um, but guess what? Is there blessings? Absolutely there's blessings. Do I regret it and think, wow, I wish, I wish she'd stayed working so we had the double income, and, you know, we could have the, the BMW parked outside and, you know, no. No, not at all. You know, God, God blesses, okay? Um, what else do we see? We also saw that when money is involved, people can stir up a lot of trouble. You know, when these people are going to, you know, they, they were going to lose their income. Hey, we're not going to be making this money anymore. Then, you know, self-interest, it's a powerful, it's a powerful force. You know, and that's why, that's one of the reasons why this whole push, push for vaccination. There's a lot of money that's made in it. 
I mean, pharmaceutical companies, they make a lot of money, a huge amount of money. And of course, the thing about it is, it's kind of like easy money, because when you get money that's paid for by the government, when you're spending someone else's money, they, hey, they'll just pay all sorts, because that's not yours, you know? I remember when I used to work for a, a biggish company, and, and it's like the, the, the amount that they would pay for stuff, it's like, because why? Because the people writing the check, it's not coming out of their pocket, you know? Um, anyway, but we shouldn't, it shouldn't be about self-interest for the believer. It should be about, we should have other people's interests. It says in, um, in Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, it says in uh, Philippians 2, 3, it says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. This is what we should be like. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We should follow Jesus' example and be humble, and have other people's interest ahead of our own interest. Okay? So, what, I mean, put this into practice, what do we do? We preach the gospel to people, even though it might cause offence. Because when we're pre- preaching the gospel to someone, we're putting their needs first. Yeah. Like if I'm thinking of my needs, well, hey, well, I'm on my way to heaven. You know, it's all fine. And if I say this to them, they might get angry. They might not like me. And no one, what, no one likes that, do they? But the thing is, if I think, well, hey, I'm going to put your needs first. You might not know it, but look, let me show you what the Bible says. Okay, that's putting other people's needs first. And then towards the end of the chapter, what do we see? Oh, we saw blind obedience that people can have to a belief system. And, of course, as Christians, we shouldn't be like that. We shouldn't be people that have blind obedience. You know, the, the, the Bible says in First Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says, um, uh, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. With meekness and fear. In other words, be polite about it. You don't need to be rude about it. You know, and that's probably one of the things that, you know, the guy that sort of got in strife for, you know, the, the, you know about it was because of, um, it wasn't necessarily in meekness and fear, you know, he, he sort of said things that was not necessarily the wisest things to say. He says, look, we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to do it with meekness and fear. In fact, it says in, um, in Colossians, Colossians chapter number four, Colossians chapter four, in verse number six, it says, let your speech be all way with grace. Season with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So we should be people who speak with grace. You know, the words that come out of our mouth. Think about them. You know, don't be hasty. Think before you speak. Okay? Um, anyway, that was a great chapter, and I'm looking forward to next week and, uh, and Sunday as well. And also pudding. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word, and thank you for, um, yeah, thank you for each person here tonight. Lord, thank you for the great time of fellowship we've had. And thank you for, um, yeah, the, the wonderful food. And um, Lord, I just pray that you'd bless each one of us and, and help us to walk in a way that pleases you, Lord. Help us to put other people's needs before our own. Help us to think, especially of the lost, and the, the need to preach the gospel to them. Um, in this chapter, the, there was some gospel preaching that went on, but, and it looked like there was going to be persecution, but then um, it, it sort of all diffused. And uh, yeah, Lord, thank you that you can protect us you know sometimes uh we do go through hard times and and persecution and tribulation but other times you do protect us and lord um yeah we ask that you, that you would protect us and that you would um enable us to be more effective as we preach the gospel uh, we thank you and praise you and love you in jesus precious name amen